on behalf of the Ramalinga Swami Center, I'm honored to welcome today Professor Shilpa Fatke, Professor at the School of Media and Cultural Studies, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Uh, she's here today to speak to us as a part of our colloquium series on gender equity and social determinants of health. Now, she is the co-author of the critically acclaimed and imminently readable book, Why Loiter, Women in Risk on Mumbai Streets, which was published in Penguin by 2011, and still a decade plus later, still remains a, a fantastic uh, book for everyone to pick up. Um, and she was also the co-director of the documentary film Under the Open Sky, which came out in 2016. She has written and spoken widely in academic and non-academic spaces about women's mobility, access to and use of public spaces, and the construction of femininity, femininity and related topics. Um, this is just a small, you know, small, small piece of what she does. Uh, I'm only pulling up the ones that we feel would be of most interest to us today. Um, although this lecture is not directly related to health, as our previous colloquia speakers have been, we wanted to try something a little bit different today. Uh, we understand that the work that Professor Shilpa Fatke does has much to do uh, more broadly with women's well-being, and we hope to make those linkages clear via this talk and perhaps the discussion that follows. As always, I request all the attendees to please put your questions in the question and answer box and we'll pick them up at the end of the talk. Uh, once again, a warm welcome to Professor Shilpa Fatke. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, Ava. I'm really delighted to be here and to be part of this series. It's a really exciting series. Um, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, I hope that's uh, visible. I'm I'm sort of structuring my talk around. Uh, so I'm I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the with the book and its arguments. So for that reason, I'm just very quickly going to run through some of the arguments of the book, and then move on to to the question of violence and look at the idea of normal violence. What is normal violence? And then look at questions of agency and fun, and finally look at questions of well being. Um, Okay, um, so to start with with the book and to start with the arguments that that we were making, um, we started this research as as some of you perhaps know between two thousand three and two thousand six as part of a project that we call the Gender and Space Project, uh, for which we had funding, and the idea really was to look at women's access to public space in the city. Um, we chose methodologically to do a, a, a wide rather than a deep analysis. And so to that end, we did 14 different neighborhoods in the city trying to engage with women's access to public space where we did interviews, uh, we did ethnographies, we did, we did uh, neighborhood histories, trying really to understand what facilitates women's access to public space. And we were looking at infrastructure, we were looking at parks, railway stations, roads. Um, the, the agenda really was to think of the ways in which one might enhance women's access to public space. Things we found was that the discourse of safety framed almost every conversation in relation to public space. And uh, we also realized very quickly that safety was perfectly compatible with various patriarchal ideologies, right? That it was uh, tied to respectability, it was tied to having a purpose in public space. And that eventually it was conditional upon women being respectable, upon women being normative, and eventually was very, very compatible with all kinds of restrictions being placed on women. So it was very easy to say that women should be safe in public space while simultaneously placing all kinds of restrictions on women in access to public space. And so we began really to argue that what women needed in order to have unconditional access to the city was not safety, but the right to take risks. And we pointed out two things. One, that men were not safe in public space either, but nobody ever said that they should not be there. It's not like men were not being attacked in public space. And two, that women were indeed not safe in their homes. In fact, global data suggests that women's homes are perhaps the most unsafe spaces for them. But yet we never tell women not to be in their homes, right? We urge them to be in this very place. And so we, what we argued was that what women need is the right to take risks 
without their presence in public space being questioned, which is not that women should never be attacked because we said no public space is safe, one's homes are not safe, no city is safe, but that if one should be, if one is attacked, then one uh, one's right to be in that place should not be questioned and one should receive a citizen's right to redress. And we argued that the right to risk then would transform women from clients seeking protection to citizens claiming rights. Uh, we found also, and this I think was very, very important for our argument around loitering. Uh, we found that it was not just women who were being seen as outsiders to public space, right? Women, particularly respectable women, middle-class women, were always seen under threat of contamination from the city, right? That the that somehow they would get attacked or just being in the city would somehow contaminate them. However, it was inevitably marginal citizens other than women, so particularly lower-class men, uh, street sex workers who were seen as the source of the contagion. So who would contaminate women? It would be these, uh, the good women. It would be these people, right? And this logic would render both women and other marginal citizens, whether they were lower class men or migrant men, outsiders to public space. With women as potential victims of violence and lower class and migrant men as potential uh, perpetrators of violence, right? And so we began to argue that as long as women's access to public space was contingent upon the exclusion of others, it would forever be conditional, right? So if women could only be in public space if lower class men, and this would often uh, translate into even hawkers as well. And in fact, much of our data suggested and our interviews with women suggested that hawkers provide both additional street lighting, they provide eyes on the street, and they provide people who hang around the hawkers, right? And so, in fact, they contribute to greater comfort rather than the opposite. So we realized that as long as women's access was tied uh, to the exclusion of other marginal citizens, women would only ever have conditional access. And the only way in which we could claim unconditional access was if we claimed it for everybody else. Two. And I'll come back, I'll come back to that argument in a while. Now, so what we then began thinking about was loitering. Okay. This idea that one could reclaim the streets as citizens as a space to pretty much hang out and do nothing. Um, we also made arguments in relation to neoliberal capitalist consumption. And we said that people who are loitering are rarely consuming anything, right? And it's also a pushback against the neoliberal order where increasingly any presence in the public must be a presence that is linked to consumption, right? And of course, the 1990s also made consumption productive. In a way, of course, those of us who grew up in the 1970s and 80s never saw consumption as productive, right? Consumption was always conspicuous consumption in a socialist country. It was deeply problematic if you consumed in an ostentatious way. But of course, globalization changed all of this and uh, consumption now becomes productive. But loitering is choose consumption, right? At the most, you'll be drinking like cutting chai standing on the streets. So you're no, you're not in the neoliberal parlance, you're not fueling the economy in any way. And so we argued that the only way in which women could claim the streets unconditionally was if everyone, including those who were unfriendly to women, could also have an unconditional claim to streets. So this would basically means recognizing that everybody is a citizen and by that token has a right to the city. Okay. Uh, that's a very, very short introduction to the broad arguments that we made in the book, but I wanted to frame them uh, for uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them. Um, in 2010, yeah, 2010, uh, just in fact, this 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 essay pre day was written around around the same time as the book. One second. I just I have notes in a different on a different uh, screen, so I'm just pulling those up. Um, and so for the 
for purposes of this presentation, I'm I'm drawing on on this this particular piece of uh, this particular piece that I wrote, which was looking at the idea of violence and how we theorize and understand violence. And so I'm going to read a little bit. Um, how does one understand this notion of normal in relation to gendered violence? Is normal violence the violence that is so ubiquitous that it is no longer worthy of comment? Is normal violence that which is sanctioned by existing power hierarchies and therefore unremarkable? Is normal violence the internalization of these power hierarchies so that certain kinds of violence, exercise of power, appear legitimate? Is it the acceptance of the supposed rationality that women are not safe in public space? Is it the restrictions that women place on their own movements? The anxiety that makes women constantly look over their shoulders? A discomfort with darkness as a result of being told over and over that the night is not safe for women? The catcalls and comments that women face every day? The conditioning that we should ignore these things and walk on as if nothing happened? Blaming oneself for being harassed? Was I wearing the wrong things, looking back in the wrong way or out in the wrong place? Being unable to access public space without purpose. The denial of open and unquestioned access to public space. In other words, everyday negotiations. How, when, and with whom to commute. When not to be out at all. What to wear, where to walk. How to modify one's gaze. And other kinds of strategies that women employ in public space. All of which might be seen as constituting the realm of normalized violence. In the larger public discourse, however, violence is only seen to have been committed when women are physically attacked and to a lesser extent when they're sexually harassed in an explicitly verbal manner. Women, however, have to deal with the possibility of attack and or harassment every day, even when it does not happen. This effectively circumscribes women's access to public space and yet, unless women are actually attacked, no violence is seen to have been committed. Feminist scholars have pointed out that such normalized violence often leads to situations and states that are then further normalized as female pathologies, right? So then it's, it's women's fault, of course, if they, if they exhibit a kind of PTSD in relation to public space, right? Esther? <laughs> De La Costa Ma Ma Maya in 1996 observes that a social anxiety about the place occupied by women in public space also has an acute impact on women's own anxieties in regard to these public spaces, sometimes to the extent of pathology in the form of agoraphobia, the fear of open spaces. In certain contexts and situations, when the risk of violence against women in public space, real or perceived is greater, agoraphobia assumes an endemic form. Maya writes ominously, and I quote, at night in most large cities, all women are agoraphobic, close quote. In our research in Mumbai as well, women articulated a heightened anxiety about being out in public spaces night, at night. This, however, was always seen in, as a realistic fear of possible violence and not as pathological, which further might demonstrate the erasure of what is seen as normal violence. The presence of normal violence as unremarkable and as something women simply have to deal with in public is not unconnected to instances of brutal violence, but has to be seen along a continuum where the presence of normal violence might even condone acts that might be cast as abnormal violence. Everyday stare, staring and leering at local railway stations and on trains must not be seen as separate from assaults on women in the same trains. When I suggest a continuum, I do not mean to imply an easy slide from verbal harassment to rape or to suggest that they are the same thing. Rather, the presence of everyday sexual harassment not just indicates women's out of placeness in public space, but also normalizes violence in public space. She got harassed because she was out of place. She got raped because she was in the wrong place. In both instances, what is really being said is this, she, the woman, should not be in that place. This thinking then allows women to be blamed when they are victims of more brutal attacks. Violent crimes against women 
further contribute to reducing women's access to public space, especially when they are flashed across television screens and newspapers, reminding women that they are not safe in the city. As part of the pro project, when we, uh, when we organize uh, focus group discussion around this, uh, around uh, questions of violence. And in 2005, some of you may know there was a, a rape of a college going girl by a police constable on Marine Drive, which is sort of this fairly visible and iconic landmark in the city of Mumbai. Uh, and when we, we sort of did focus group discussions with young women around this, many of them said that the white publicity around the crime often led to a greater policing of their movements and hence a decreased mobility in public space. So all of them were very worried about this, but they were worried less about being actually attacked and much more worried about their mobility being restricted. In the violence of normal times then, for women, risk is applicable in its adjective form. That is, to be at risk rather than in its verb form, that is, to take risks. Okay, so, so some of you might have recently seen the judgment from the from Justice the Devan Ramchandran of the Kerala High Court in relation to curfews in 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 a in a, in a woman's hostel. There, there was one particular case uh, where where there was a case around uh, the attendance curfews, and his judgment is really it's I think they're very very interesting because. Uh, for the first time, you have a court saying lock the men up because they're the ones who are potentially trouble and put the curfew for men after 8 p.m. and let the women be out. What's, it makes, what makes it really all the more interesting is that precisely, almost in exactly these words, uh, Rokya Sakhavat Hussain writing Sultana's Dream in 1905 uh, says pretty much the same thing. I'm, I'm going to quote a little bit from them, uh, from Sultana's Dream. Where are the men? I asked her. Uh, and, and she sort of, Sultan, uh, uh, Sakhavat Hussain uh, in Sultana's Dream presents to us uh, a utopia in the shape of a dream. It's an environmental utopia. It's a, it's a, it's a utopia for women, uh, where women pretty much uh, run, the, run the government and the show. And so, so here's Sultana asking the woman she meets in her dream or whom she meets in this place called Lady Lad. Right? So she asked her, where are the men? I asked her, in their proper places, where they ought to be. Pray, let me know what you mean by their proper places. Oh, I see my mistake. You cannot know our customs as you were never here before. We shut our men indoors. Just as we are kept in the zenana? Exactly so. How funny. I burst into a laugh. Sister Sarah laughed too. But dear Sultana, how unfair it is to shut in the harmless women and let loose the men. Why? It is not safe for us as Zenana as we are naturally weak. Yes, it is not safe as long as there are men about on the streets, nor is it so when a wild animal enters a marketplace. Of course not. Suppose, this is Sister Satara again, suppose some lunatics escape from the asylum and begin to do all sorts of mischief to men, horses and other creatures. In that case, what will your countrymen do? They will try to capture them and put them back in their asylum. Thank you. And do you not think that it is wise to keep sane people inside an asylum and let loose the insane? Of course not, I said laughing lightly. As a matter of fact, in your country, this very thing is done. Men who do or at least are capable of doing no end of mischief are let loose and the innocent women shut up in the zanana. How can you trust those untrained men out of doors? So that's, I'm sorry, I went back once. Yeah. So that's uh, from, from Sultana's uh, dream. So one might then argue, right, that within this context, that Protectionism is often experienced by women as, as violence. And one of the things we, uh, we saw was that, um, yeah, one minute, I'm just going to continue reading. Uh, like Rokia Sakawato sense suggests in her fictional piece, rationality is a strange thing. It is possible to present as logical and rational something which is not by articulating it in a language that makes it appear so. 
In this case, as Hussein suggests, the irrationality of locking up potential victims when potential perpetrators walk the streets freely. It would not be rational to suggest that women should not be in the public because they may meet the wrong kind of men. Right? Because one of, the way, one of the things we found in our research was also that while families and communities are deeply, deeply concerned about their, uh, about their daughters being attacked against their will, they are almost as concerned that their daughters, particularly young women, will meet and fall in love with the wrong kind of men, the wrong caste, the wrong class, the wrong community, and all of these. Um, and we also found that young women were, as much as they were concerned about their physical safety, they were concerned about their reputations. And they were concerned about how they would be seen. Um, and so it would not be rational to suggest that women should not be in the public because they may meet the wrong kind of men. But saying that women are unsafe because of the possibility of violent sexual attack has a kind of altruistic rationality, i.e. that it is for women's own good. This diktat then covers both possibilities in one stroke. It protects women both from those outside men whom they do not want to know as well as those whom they might want to know. There is no objective definition of violence. What is defined as violence is highly subjective. Violence that takes place within predefined norms and structures of authority, whether state or community or family, and we know this more and more, is normalized as intended to maintain order and therefore not seen as violence at all. Right? This is something that we are extremely familiar with, violence perpetrated in the name of the maintenance of order. Aggression that is sanctioned either by the law or by social norm is seen not as violence, but as just retribution. Violence that is officially sanctioned through familial or community authority of whatever kind then is no longer seen as violence. So also the denial of women's access to the public is not about violence, but about the rationality of safety. That is private, safe, public, dangerous. If women refuse to accept this rationality of safety, it is then presumed that violence is the logical outcome. The fear is not of violence, but of uncontrolled violence by unknown persons. This selective labeling of violence, in fact, allows sanctioned familial and community violence to be justified in the name of avoidance of unknown stranger violence. The imposition of safety involves a series of violences which include restrictions in clothing, demeanor, and mobility. These restrictions are justified as being rational and reflect the exercise of a familial and community authority expressed as being in women's best interests. I would like to argue that acts of extreme coercive violence against women must also be understood in relation to the repressive response that greets women's consensual acts as agents particularly as sexual agents. Women's actions as sexual agents are often seen as posing a threat to the reified notion of Indian culture and undermining the established order of family, community, and even the nation. And these institutions are willing to use violence in order to protect themselves from this threat. The question of violence here then is not about whether it can be prevented, but how it can be managed. It becomes clear that safety and violence in relation to women's access to public space are not really opposites at all. For in the interest of maintaining safety, women might find themselves subject to all manner of violence. At the same time, the possibility of engaging public space, of taking on the unknown and placing oneself by choice at risk of violence that may or may not happen and might in fact offer possibilities for women to enhance and expand their access to public space uh, and in the process take a feminist engagement with cities one step forward. So what I'm really arguing is that safety and violence are not necessarily opposites. And that protectionism, particularly one that denies access to the public, might very well be experienced. And many, many women argue this, that uh, it's experienced by them as, as violence. Now, the other side, so one is the suggestion that safety and violence are opposites. The other is the suggestion that risk, risk and violence are the same, that if you take risk, violence will follow. Now, what I'm trying to do is also break that connection and to 
argue that risk and violence are not necessarily the same and that risk taken by choice may actually, they may lead to violence, of course, but of course, we also know that safety also leads to violence. Um, but the taking risk may also lead to great grand adventures, great fun, and all kinds of other other pleasures that that one might seek seek by choice. Uh, so, for instance, one of the things that uh, that women would would point out to us was that if perhaps they they were out beyond their curfew, right? And of course, when women are out late at night, women are looking over their shoulders. They are checking. Uh, double checking they are producing they're basically producing safety for themselves at uh sort of on a, on a sort of minute to minute basis but at the same time quite often and and so certainly in a city like mumbai which we were studying it is entirely possible to be out late at night and have have a really good time but if you break your curfew and you go back when you go back home some form of violence is almost certain whether it's being shouted at or being told you can't go out but that violence which takes place when you go back that structural violence is never called violence it's called protectionism it's called care it's even called love right and so what I tried to argue in, in that paper was that the best long-term strategy for women to enhance claims to public space is to embrace risk and pleasure while accepting violence as something that must be negotiated in the process of taking risks. Okay. Uh, the next thing that I want to focus on is looking at questions of agency and fun. And agency draws almost, both agency and fun, almost draw directly from the earlier uh, slide. And, and here I draw on a paper that I published in 2020, looking at uh, the idea of frivolous fun. And though I don't go into that argument here, because I'm trying to focus on questions of uh, trying to make connections between fun and well-being and access to public space. But uh, in that paper, I also take on critiques that point out that or, or that argue that young women claiming space are doing so as individualistic, entrepreneurial, neoliberal subjects. And I, I sort of try and argue that these acts of claiming public space, uh, rather than being individual, are collective acts of claiming as citizens. But that's not what I'm trying to focus on on here. I'm just going to quickly leave this slide on here. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we we use uh, when we started working on on fun, and when we wrote about it in our book, there was very little work actually on fun, and and the only definition we found was in 2007 paper by the sociologist Asif Bayat, who who wrote this really fascinating essay. If any of you are interested on Islamism and the politics of fun. I'm going to leave that slide for a moment for y'all to just read his definition. What we did was drawing on Bayat's de their definition, we tried to create a definition of our own, which now when we look at it, perhaps we would have liked to have expanded, but, but that's the definition we produced in, in our book. And our aim really was to connect fun to, to loitering. Okay, um, what I was trying to think about is that what does this fun mean, right? And 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 in order to, to think about fun and the challenge that fun poses to, to the patriarchal powers that be, I drew on the work of Sara Ahmed, who wrote The Promise of Happiness. She also has a blog that perhaps many of you are familiar with called Feminist Killjoys, right? And... Uh, and, and her argument really is that let's take this figure of the feminist killjoys 
see, seriously, is the fe fe feminist the one killing people's joy by pointing out sexism? Or does the feminist merely expose all of the problematic uh, thing that is pushed under the carpet, right? So does is the problem somebody articulating anger or uh, is 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 uh, or, or or you know uh, is is this actually allowing us to engage with the problem and her her, her suggestion though uh, is that the feminist troublemaker might be trouble because she gets away uh, in she gets in the way of the happiness of others and uh, 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 and sarah ahmed in fact is making a case for all of us to be feminist killjoys, right? To ask difficult questions, to be at the dining table. And, and she uses at some point the, the, the figure, the image of the dining table. And here's this family, and here's the feminist who's sort of killing the joy of this wonderful, the promise of the wonderful meal by, by bringing up the fact that the production of the meal is a gendered activity. It involves particular kinds of gendered labor. Sarah, what Sarah Ahmed also does, though, is she reminds us that other kinds of tables are equally fraught. So she says, let's look at a feminist table. And she's saying, if we look at a table of white feminists, and then you have a feminist of color, which in our case, of course, would translate, say, to a table of upper caste feminists that is then uh, sort of unsettled by the presence of a Dalit feminist, if you like. So, so she's using the metaphor of the, of the table of white feminists, which then you have a, a a feminist of color who unsettles by asking difficult questions. She unsettles the, the apparent camaraderie and the apparent uh, cogency of the arguments that might otherwise be made if we don't take into account color, right? Um, in relation to our own work and fun, one of the things we kept being asked after we wrote the book, and a lot of these questions came from feminist scholars and activists. They kept asking us, but why would you want to loiter? Even good men don't loiter. Yeah, so loitering was seen as this kind of uh, highly suspicious activity that unemployed migrant men might engage in. Secondly, they also said that this is all very well. You're asking for all kinds of PV people to loiter. But uh, we work with young women who are actually afraid to walk on the streets because a group of young men stand there and they pass comments at them. And, and, and how do you respond to that? Um, the second question that they asked us, which actually for the longest time we had no answer for, was the question, how will you operationalize loitering? And really, when we began this, we uh, this was a utopian vision of what we imagined might a city could look like that could enhance uh, access to the city, a city that would look like that would look more egalitarian. Um, Luckily for us, okay, so these slides moved for some reason, huh? um, but, but, but again, this is again drawing on, on, on Ahmed, uh, that when women claim fun in public space, they produce in others not happiness, but anxiety, right? The presence of women in public spaces, oh my God, here are these women, uh, they, are, uh, they are here, they might be attacked. Uh, how do we deal with the problem of women? Or alternatively, they are here and they are they are trouble because they're going to do all kinds of things that we don't want them to do, right? Uh, and so the argument really that fun creates trouble, even as it troubles the boundaries of what is acceptable behavior for women in the quest to push the boundaries of access to the city. So one of the things that came out of these questions, really, these questions being asked to us, why would you want to lie loiter? How will you operationalize loitering? Was that having fun in public space was very low down on what Nidhita Menon has called the hierarchy of oppressions, right? Um, education, healthcare, employment, all of those are right at the top. For the longest time, even sexuality was dodgy, that here are women who don't have access to healthcare and education, and you want to talk about sexual preference, but that sort of gained a kind of legitimacy. Fun, when we wrote the book, was very, very much at the bottom of this pile, you know, this kind of uh, why are we even talking about fun? Why are we not talking about more serious issues? You know, that, that here is a situation where women don't have access to uh, basic, uh, basic resources and you want to talk about fun. But what we were trying to argue is that fun really pushes the boundaries uh, for women and it pushes the boundaries of a fe feminist articulation of what we might desire. All right, 
this question that how will you operationalize loitering, right? The blah, blah, blank noise pro 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 project was started in 2003, pretty much alongside our project. So we knew uh, Jasmine Pateja, and I'll show, show you all a couple of pictures from the Blank Noise Project, uh, almost from the beginning of our research, and they really campaign against street sexual harassment. The Why Loiter movement is one that began in 2014, and a theater artist by the name of Neha Singh read our book, and she used the book to start loitering in the city. Uh, she loitered, she wrote about it, a group of people wrote about it, they did videos of themselves, they engaged with people, they gave interviews, so much so that in 2016, Neha Singh was on BBC's list of 100 most influential women in gender activism. Yeah, so for us, it was like, really deeply, deeply exciting that uh, finally our ideas were being operationalized, right? Uh, and the third, uh, the third, uh, and then there are multiple groups, I'm just picking three to talk about. The third group that I want to talk about are the girls at Dhabas who are on the other side of the border in Pakistan. And uh, they started in 2015 and uh, they started in Karachi and then expanded into mostly Lahore and Islamabad uh, where they would pretty much just sit at dhabas and drink tea. Then they began to organize cricket matches in public space. They organized cycle rallies. They tried to collect money to start a dhaba of their own, but I think they didn't collect enough money. Um, and so these movements, these movements of young, mostly young women claiming public space for fun, for recreation, for pleasure, pretty much sort of responded to this question, but of why would you want to loiter and how will you operationalize loitering? So I'm going to run, uh, I think I have about uh, about five or seven minutes. Yeah, Abha, five, seven minutes is good? Absolutely, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to run through some of these slides just to take you through these projects. For those of, some of you may already be familiar with them, but for those of you who are not familiar with them, here's blank noise. Um, their uh, tagline and what Jasmine did when she was a student of the Shrishti School of Design was she started this project looking at street sexual harassment and the, and the tagline they used was, I never asked for it or I did not ask for it or I never asked for it. Uh, and she invited people to send her clothing in which they were harassed. And you can see the range of clothing she got. And one of the things they would do is hold exhibitions, both in exhibition spaces, but also on the street where they would just simply stand there with the clothing in which women were, were harassed. Yeah. Uh, Blank Noise also started something called Meet to Sleep, where they invited uh, women to uh, to sleep in public parks and and this entire thing of my right to live defenseless and really to look back and to challenge the notion that women need to constantly look over our shoulders right to constantly strategize and so here was something that said that come come sleep in your public your local public park uh, and 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 many of us have participated in meet to sleep uh, here's the violator movement uh, started in 2014. I already told you a little bit about that. They would take cycles and uh, travel. And this picture actually is from their blog. So, which is why it's got Why Loiter on it. They have a blog. I think it's on Blogspot. It's called whyloiterblogspot.com. Uh, they would wander late at night, uh, take pictures of themselves, upload them on social media. All of these, all of these uh, three campaigns used social media very very effectively in fact the girls at dhabas and i'll come come i'll sort of talk about them a bit more uh talked about how they were able to create a community online and sa 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 sadia khatri who uh, this is a picture of name of, of neha singh there's the girls at dhabas uh started in 2015 and Sa, 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 uh, sa, Sadia Kakatri, who started this, uh, who, was, who was part of the initiators of the movement, along with a couple of others, said that when they started their Facebook group, and they had literally thousands of people joining the group, and they would have all of these discussions online. And uh, we, in an interview with her, we asked, we, we were try, try, trying to talk about online communities. And she said, the moment somebody asked a question, and she said, someone who was part of that community, who was not part of the girls at Dahabas themselves, 
answered the question. She's saying that's when we knew that we were a community, that here was a community that got it. And now they were they were responding to each other. They were not waiting for the, the people who were part of the campaign uh, to, to respond. Yeah, so these are again pictures from, from the girls at Abbas. This is their satirical rally that they organized a couple of times. Okay, uh, one of the things we found subsequently in the last uh, 11 years is that this question of how to operationalize is one that was answered. They more or less picked up the ideas of the book and some of them had not even read the book. It's sort of, um, and, and they, ran, they ran with these ideas, they expanded them, they made them deeply exciting. But what we found and for us was most exciting as people who were part of uh, these ideas and writing the book, was that the word loitering became very much part of a feminist lexicon of access to public space. That is that the word loitering was being used by people who did not know our book existed. And for us, that was really very, very much uh, a sign of its, of its success. That even while the mainstream discourse on women's access remains mired in safety, it's like deeply, deeply about safety, the feminist discourse has really taken on board the question of uh, loitering. Here's also a picture from, uh, from the Me to Sleep. Uh, that's me and the on the extreme mic, yeah, on the extreme right. Um, so here are my final co 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 comments here to just try and think about what this means. If we think of fun as relevant to well-being, if we think of the right to live without violence, the right to live without fear of violence, and the right to also to negotiate violence as we choose, right? Because nobody's lives are, are free of restrictions or free of, nobody's lives are free of life violence, but what right do we have to negotiate or to make choices in what we negotiate? And one of the things uh, that we've learned from the pandemic is that being locked into our houses is not good for our mental health, right? Um, that there have been clear connections made between being able to socialize, being outside for work, for pleasure, and, and our mental health. And if we see this as a group of, of women as a group are denied access to this uh, as part of some kind of agenda around safety uh, or even articulated as patriarchal agendas on women's proper place, right? What does this mean for women's long-term well-being? Uh, for women, the, uh, the loss of access to public space is very much experienced as violence. And we also know that uh, depression in women may also be linked to the denial of access to the outside. And so though my own work is not in health, um, I'd really uh, sort of welcome a discussion from those of you who do work in health to think about what it means and perhaps to, to, to take forward this, this, this line of thinking and, and to do research on what access to the public might mean uh, to, to well-being. Thank you so much. I'm going to just stop sharing my screen.